This episode of The Jesse T Show is brought to you by 46 and 2 Wealth Partners. This year, many people have lots of money questions. Finding the right information can be tough, and more importantly, finding someone that you like and have confidence in is even tougher. If you'd like to keep more of your money, and more importantly, if you'd like to stop trading time for money and live the life you deserve, contact 46 and 2 Wealth Partners today. Right now, Jesse T Show listeners will receive a free 15 minute phone call that will leave you with at least one idea on how to keep or make more money. Text promo code Jesse T Show to phone number 202 301 4503. Sebastian, great to see your face again, brother. Likewise. Good yeah, to be man. here. It's, 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 it's a pleasure. I'm, I'm so happy we've been connecting a bunch uh, over the last couple of weeks. And you know, there's a lot of uh, cool things we've been kind of getting into. And just for some context for the people that are listening and watching, you and I found each other uh, in a mastermind that we were a part of. And it was uh, at the end of 2019. So I haven't actually been able to share physical space with you since then, but I'm really happy that we're actually connecting virtually these days. Yeah, likewise. It's amazing how some of these things, people that you just come across, and it can be across the world, um, for good and for bad, and some of the closest people to me are spread out throughout the entire world, and they're not close to me and haven't been for years. So, hey, this might be another one. Then I'm, I'm glad we can keep this connection going, Jesse. Hell yeah, me too. And, and for those, those that are listening, you know, we connected through uh, Aubrey Marcus's mastermind, which is called Fit for Service. And Fit for Service is um, just this community of similarly minded people that want to evolve uh, in their relationships and their, you know, their relationship with themselves, their relationship with those that they love, their relationships with, um, you know, if they have businesses with their clients, their relationships with God and, and what that looks like for individually, every one of those people in the group. And so I know when I went to that, uh, you know, fit for service mastermind, it was the spirituality uh, quarter. So quarter four of 2019 was for spirituality. And it was everything I was looking for. And uh, that's where we met. So, so how did you get into fit for service and talk a little bit about what drew you to it and some of your takeaways from fit for service? The short or the long? The long. Yeah. The go long. For it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, um, <clears throat> so I have one parent, uh, my father was very structured, um, comes from a farm. Uh, I grew up on an Island outside of the coast of Sweden and he grew up on a farm. He's very hardworking. Um, and he worked his way every single day, that traditional, oh, well, I didn't have any free time. I didn't have the enjoyment. It was school. Oh, I, I biked or I walked for miles and miles and came back and I worked and I worked and I never stopped. So that, that you have that part that is part of me. And then you have my mom who, uh, came from a uh, philosophy, you can say, a family with where they grew vegetables and stuff in their backyard. So they immigrated from Germany over to Sweden. So I came from two very mixed families, um, one spiritual philosophical side and one hardworking discipline, all this structure. So that meshed, uh, long story short, many years later, I find myself, we can dig deep into my story later, but uh, Aubrey Marcus, is a mix of both. He is a mix of both the practical, the business side, and then also the philosophy and spiritual side. So that's what drew me to him. And uh, something I've been talking to my wife about, she joined for a while as well, is the, the coolness side. Because uh, if you look at spirituality in Sweden, it has a uh, hippy dippy uh, association <laughs> with it. And a lot of people are just completely out there and uh, they don't have this uh, sometimes uh, touch with reality. And you don't come across that as often here in the United States. I mean, there's still, there's a fair share, but here in California, there's still like, hey, you can be an integrated, fully connected, tapped in human being. And if you want to be connected on all levels, spirituality is one of them. Yep. And um, being able to have that, that sense of reality, uh, that there are multiple different levels that you function on from side to side, up and down just this whole spectrum. And the, the older I get, the more I realize that spirituality is such a key part of it. And I started off with fitness. Uh, that is really where my passion is. I then went into, I got degrees in organizational leadership, the philosophy, the psychology, just human behavior overall. And, um, uh, at one point I got into fitness because it, it transcended my awareness for 
how one can push boundaries. And really that is my fascination with performance and how greatly you can push yourself and find out new things about yourself and other people when you're at the brink of almost a collapse. Uh, so taking it to extremes, but then also dialing it back to extremes. And when someone really experiments with that and you have Tim Ferriss is one of them, he takes it to another level, right? I mean, you have Tony Robbins, like there's some of these people, I'm, I mean, I'm never going to come close to that. And I don't want to either uh, for what they've done to themselves. But Aubrey Marcus, he incorporates life questions at a deeper degree that I've, I've realized or um, come across with any other person. And the self-love that integrates is, is phenomenal. I, I, especially for us, I think for us men, when we just are so high charging and we get in and after something so harshly all the time, we only measure our worth and who we are based on, on our numbers, uh, what we put up uh, from a, a monetary perspective. We simply measure ourselves like on our titles and everything else you can see, touch or feel. Like I've refused for the longest time ever to pay for any service because I was simply of the mindset like, hey, I need to be able to see it, feel it, smell it, whatever is reality. Yeah. I need to be able to experience it in person and who needs the whatever talk like, yeah, I'm interested in, in psychology, but I can figure it out myself. I'm a man, God damn it. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been that surrendering piece that, that um, and just realizing, hey, I don't know it all. Like I, there, there are plenty of wrong turns I've done in my life and plenty of, of brick walls that I've ran into and not ran through. Like I ran through a few, but there are some that I realize, hey, it's not about just running through walls. So that's, that's the, that's a mix of it. And, uh, feel free to jump into yeah. Yeah. whatever so, comes so to I your wanna, mind on that. I want to touch on surrender, uh, yeah. pretty well here in a little bit, but how did you find Aubrey or how did Aubrey find you? How did you first get exposed to him? What did you think about him initially? Cause I know some people have mixed thoughts. Some people are, they love him. They think he's weird. <laughs> um, and then, you know, over time he might grow on you or turn you off kind of thing. But what, what was your first initial reaction? How'd you find out about him? And you know, what, what called on you to go to fit for service and how long were you in fit for service? Yeah. So I, my wife, um, you can say got me into biohacking. I've been dabbling. Well, I, I never really got into podcasting. Uh, I was all about watching motivational. Okay. Elliot Hulse, I gotta say, I don't know if you know who that is, but no. he is a strong man. He is, um, motivational speaker, whatever on, on YouTube. He has a show and other stuff, but really it's the fitness, um, just pushing yourself harder and getting into sports and just being able to, it's, it's when you go in, and that's the physical and a mental plane. And part of it is part spiritual too. With, with, when you, when you find yourself in a game or lifting weights and it's so you're so in the moment, it becomes a spiritual experience in itself because yeah. you're so incredibly present in that moment. Um, I then realized that later on, cause I had such high self-criticism and had such high, um, there are some times that are very difficult to get past, uh, or even moments when I didn't feel like I measured up when I met my wife that changed because if she, it was such an overwhelming amount of love that she showed me. Wow. I'm when, like, when you first connected the very first moment mm, there, oh yeah, almost like it was, it was something out of a storybook. Like I've never experienced it. We, we literally, How'd you it, meet? It, yeah. So <laughs> it, it was out of a, um, <laughs> A, a prior relationship ended and I was looking for a new, new place. And I was starting, I, at that point realized I'm not going to do the master's kinesiology. We did brain traumatic brain studies and, and, uh, just getting into the administrative of being some high level, uh, you can say exercise, uh, leader. I wanted more of the, the, the exercise part and the anatomy cause I wanted to open up my own CrossFit gym. Um, I realized that's not for me. Uh, I realized I don't know how much time I have left here in, in the United States because if you're not an engineer, even if you're an engineer right now, or if you're, if you're great at math, it's very hard. Like if you, if you look at your regular, think of your, okay, they're immigrants here in the United States. I'm an immigrant too. But a lot of people, when they see me, they're like, oh, that's not an immigrant. That's just a regular, like regular guy. No, like, and, and I think this is, this is a good didn't expect to go into this, but this is an interesting way to uh, just share reality. There are a lot of people out there that 
when they come to the United States, it's very difficult to stay. Like you can stay for a short amount of time. Like even if you add value, like you pay money to be part of the American school system, there's a lot of money. Like I could have gotten my education free, but I paid a whole lot. Well, my dad helped me pay, right? So I, 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 I got through um, two degrees and even with an MBA, um, I still would not be able to stay unless I had something very spectacular in a company that is very, um, that is usually what happens then is they, they pay you eat lower because they know they can, because now they have leverage to keep, they you. have you trapped in a sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, or if it's a fair company, then just it's, it's, it costs them to just to go through that legal process. Um, is it like I'm a work getting, visa kind of thing? Is that what it would be? Um, what, what, is, what is it? That yeah, would yeah. So, so here, usually, yeah. usually it's H one B. So H one B is is what um, it's a visa that's usually for three, five, or and then later on ten years. And okay. usually during that time, uh, you can get a green card. Long story short, I've been here in the states for now for eleven years, and it's all been education. Uh, and um, I. I was ready to leave the United States. I was going to finish up my MBA, but right when I started my MBA, I, I uh, yeah, knocked on the door to, to what the uh, house would be that I would move into and who responded then she was not supposed to be home was my wife. Uh, not at the time, but Sophia is her name. And um, she was like, well, who are you? I'm Sebastian. Well, turns out that's the name of her brother too. And uh, how about that? what would have really could have been a 20 second conversation led to 40 minutes <laughs> and uh wow first uh, first meeting yeah yeah and we went into everything from spirituality to some of the deepest questions and we were like it was so natural and that is one of the things that i've realized in life the more natural and easy it is sometimes that is just just go with it just yep. go with the flow just follow where this takes you and Ever since then, we've pretty much been <laughs> inseparable. So, how long ago was that? When did you meet her? Six years ago. Wow! And so, just that first conversation led to a whole new world, family, children, hmm. and then yeah. circling back around to uh, how you found Aubrey Marcus because you mentioned her. Um, yeah. Did she find him first and turn you on to him, or did did you know about him first? Well, so Sophia was the one that made me realize, well, spirituality can be someone integrated and cool can have spirituality part of their life. Right. <laughs> right. So, and she yeah. showed me, so she was a strength and conditioning coach. Um, and then she became more of a, you could say life coach, but she used different types of methodologies, but also biohacking. She turned me on to Dave Asprey. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. But bulletproof and, um, very cool. Um, there was another guy, his name is Jason Ferrugio. He was where I heard Aubrey Marcus first. Uh, Jason Frugia is a fitness guy, longstanding fitness guy, but he's also into all different types of how do you just make your life better? And Aubrey awesome. Mark is on there. And, um, so I hear him speak. I'm like, Whoa, all right. This guy likes partying and drugs a little too much. Yeah, but- <laughs> he did. Yeah, he still might. <laughs> yeah. Right. But, but things, things have, things have shifted more, more the younger Aubrey was, he was, um, all about, going into flow tanks um and taking different types of substances and then going to Peru. Those were a majority of the the things that that I heard him speak about whenever I spoke to him or or heard him speak. Um, but later as it progressed, he got more into different aspects of just human performance. And that's when I, I connected more and more. The more I connected to within and my spirituality and self-love, the more I started connecting with him. Um, yeah, and that's eventually what what led me to the path uh to join here last last year. Um, and I was in it for a year and it's, I think that really set me on this entrepreneurial path that I'm on right now. You just to have that sense of confidence, sense of, um, just knowing that, Hey, it doesn't matter what anyone does out there. Uh, there's a quote that goes, don't compare yourself to others, compare yourself to who you were yesterday. Beautiful. And, uh, I love it. Yeah, that, that has come up for me the last few days. And it's just significant in the way that I wanted to step away from what I, I believe or felt myself trapped in the corporate uh, sales, just beast. And it was all about numbers all the time. And uh, by listening to him, 
and, and others, but I, I started realizing, okay, there's more than just what I'm so trapped in. And especially as men, when we're chasing results all the time, yep. and then you get those, those endorphins and all that, when you hit the numbers, and when you are a high performer, it just starts coming to you. But the more that it's happening, the more I put my blinders on and no one else started really paying, like I, no one else mattered to my life. And the more I connected to him, they realized, okay, there's unicity here. And it doesn't matter just what I do in this world or in my life. Like there's so much more of a connection to everyone else in this world too. Yep. Uh, and, and the more I can focus on other people too, the more happy I will be and the more I can contribute and the more just abundance there will be for everyone instead of just getting laser focused in a Silicon Valley career, me, 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 rising the ranks, rat race, rat race, and eventually, uh, yeah, several walls. Uh, is what I hit and uh, I'm on a different yeah. path today. It's a, it's a, it's interesting because um, there has been this shift going on for, for a long time. And it seems very apparent these days with spirituality and awakened consciousness and being able to be a successful human, you know, guy or girl entrepreneur into fitness, into health and wellness, into mindset, into relationships, into self-work. I mean, there's, I feel like there's a, a beautiful change, even with everything that's going on in the world. It's, I think it's in unison, actually, what's happening in the world is, is going to be for the betterment of our, of our species as we go down the road. But um, it's good to see that there's people out there kind of leading the way and getting out there, putting themselves out there. I mean, you know, the stuff's not easy to be super vulnerable and, you know, to share scars or to share journeys. I mean, back in the day, it used to be taboo. And it used to be, you had to hide those things, especially if you wanted to be a business person, if you wanted to be a successful business person, right. I couldn't tell someone that I had a two-year drug addiction, like that would turn some people off. You know what I mean? Right. And, and, I, and I'm glad that we've shifted in the world and people like Aubrey and Kyle and so many other people that are out there. And, and those are two of the coaches and fit for services why I bring them up. But um, they, they've kind of led the way. And now, now people like us that are exposed to that and doing our own thing and have our own story. We're able to get out there and kind of live it ourselves, but also spread our own message to kind of, you know, help other people. So when you were in fit for service, I mean, I didn't meet you until Q4. I was, I was there for three months. So you had the whole year. It sounds like fit for service one, which was 2019, all of 2019 from January to December. Um, what was your initial like indoctrination? Like, were you, were you like, I found my people, this is great. Or were you kind of like, cause I know how you are as a person Were you kind of like at arm's length, like still kind of checking it out, like still putting your feelers out. Is this for me? Like, how did it feel for you? And then like, what kind of got you bought in for the rest of the year? So I was about to sign up for the entire year and, um, I made a job move at that point going from really pure outside sales and um, managing a larger territory and moving in the same time. Um, and things didn't work out as I expected. Uh, we had to leave, live with um, my my um, wife's parents for a little bit just because we moved into a house that was in very, what we didn't know, poor shape when okay. the prior tenants moved out. And um, yeah, that got me face to face with the reality check of what do I do when I can't put in all of my, when I've measured myself on my effort and how much effort I can put in because that always produce results. What happens when I'm faced with difficulty and not being able to perform because I couldn't perform because there was always something going on. I need quiet when I work. If there are people around me, I can't focus. And I'm, yeah, anyway, long story short, Commitment became an issue. Um, I was afraid to commit to something that would be an investment in my inner. Again, that's the story of, hey, like I need to be able to see, feel and experience. And more hurt I was that I couldn't get things done, the more I pushed and the worse it got. And yep. the more I started surrendering, the better it got. And the more acceptance and the more love started appearing and it was for myself but specifically too for my for my daughter and my wife and that is the biggest journey here with this company that i was with before too is is um and then stepping into fit for service eventually i realized that i need to have more of a purpose than just on a day-to-day -day when i interact with customers and and make dials and all that and uh i i joined in q3 so mid-year last year and that was full commitment on my side. I'm like, I'm all in. I'm going to take leadership on like 
in calls, I am going to just openly, vulnerably share about, hey, this is what I'm struggling with. Like I saw that as this is part me being in, yeah, you can say therapy. I almost feel like I'm, I'm hesitant to saying that because it's almost had this negative connotation to it. No but way. No. yeah, I agree. And, 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 and sharing just fully and open heartedly and finding trust because people just openly embraced you. And one of the most significant moments it was in Malibu when we had a sharing circle um, that Aubrey Marcus hosted where you were maybe 30, 40 people in a ring and you'd say, you write down 10 things that are unforgivable that you've done, yeah. that you can't forgive yourself for. And then um, we would do that. And then he said, pick the worst one. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you what, what, oh, so many, just the energy dropped when, when he said that. Um, that led to radical vulnerability. And um, people, after you said your thing, you said everyone just in, everyone said you were forgiven. And the power of that was, was something I've never experienced before. And um, a lot of people cried. A lot of people opened up about things that you could tell because we all have these stories that we think are unforgivable. And I took my round and I'm like, all right, this was challenging. But then there was one person who spoke up and it's like, no, I, I lied. And it was two. And then another guy went and then I'm like, holy, all right, this, I, I got a, today it struck me too. And the two men who shared were two of the biggest men there. They're 200 30 plus pound packs of muscle. And <laughs> these are guys that you would never think would be vulnerable. And they have this tough exterior and they broke down both of them and just weeping and sobbing. And I'm like, Whoa. And I felt this, this pull to, to share. And mine came down to, it was, it was darkness around, um, when, when my, my daughter was born, it was very challenging to have all the love taken away from myself and yep. to, to just be applied to my daughter. And, and I had been so dependent on the love from my wife because I had so little love for myself. Yep. So I was faced with the dark night of the soul from just feeling like all love has been taken away. And what I did in return was what I saw my father do to a degree was just work even harder. Mm. And I dug to a deeper and darker place. And then it started like physical resentment and dark thoughts started coming up towards, towards um, my wife and my daughter and myself. And just anytime, like I would pick up a knife, I would have these incredibly scary thoughts. And I had this trauma with knives after that. And, and something I've never never shared with anyone because I thought there was like, there's no time to do this and what will happen if someone finds out. And I'm realizing now that when we experience some of the, the most radical and darkest thoughts, it's just a way for our ego to get out of the situation because we're in so much pain and ego doesn't make any logical decisions. It just sees what can I seek or gain glory from Yep. Or what can I do to end this the quickest way possible, or get out of it or escape? And it was ending it and escaping that came up for me in that way. Mm. And um, instead of really being vulnerable and even asking for help or seeking out help, I kept pushing through. And um, um, she's sharing that. Like I, I never thought I could be forgiven for anything of that sort. And, and the people around me just like, I was, I don't know, sobbing for, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes and people around me were just embracing me. And, and oh just, my goodness. and even with the mother next to me, she's like, yeah, like I, I forgive you like that. Like, and, and I couldn't believe that, that, that would happen. Um, and realizing that some of these darkest things that we carry is what connects us. And there were people that came up to me and said that, Hey, like if that is the worst thing that you've ever experienced, then Hey, it's nothing. <laughs> it's nothing. 
it was great for people to be able to, you know, hold you physically and hold space for you and just love on you. Cause you felt you were tormented by that and you were, you know, beating yourself down even worse because of that. And, uh, you know, it's so cliche, but the truth will set you free. And, and it really does. It, it, it opens you up to a new way of living. And, uh, you know, we all have a shadow. You talk about your ego, but we all have shadow and, you know, sometimes it can lead us to dark places and sometimes it can give us thoughts that may not be in alignment with like our true selves, so to speak. Um, so for you to be able, did you share that in Q3 or Q4 last year? Do you remember? Was it Sedona Q4. or was it uh, yeah. Malibu? No, that was, that was Malibu. Malibu. I mean, okay. we were split out in groups. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But it, it's, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just, I just didn't know. So, so what, what came of that from there? Was there like a healing process you started to embark on from there and kind of like a, a letting go of just this heavy burden? Like, how did you feel after that? Yeah. One of the most healing parts of being part of that community is the community and it is knowing that you're not alone. And I think so many of us think we're alone in whatever we're going through. And I think it's because we're so isolated and we're so used to putting up this front. And especially with social media, you always show the good front. You always show what you want people. It's to always see. people's best lives, man. It's, it's yeah. don't, I heard someone say this, don't compare yourself to someone else's manufactured life. Like if you see social media and you see all the bling bling and the razzle dazzle, like most of the time that's, those are hurt people trying to put up a facade, you know? Yeah. So experience it in firsthand emotionally and, and just in person. Um, when people share some of their, their struggles and do it from a vulnerable place, it's very hard to get there. And just to be together for days makes such a significant difference. Cause they're so easy. Like in the beginning, it's hard to break that barrier. Like you have the regular, Oh, you, I got to still be on my best behavior, but eventually you start breaking <laughs> that down little by little. <laughs> but a majority of the times you never get to that. Like I find myself almost for years, like never getting to that depth except for my wife and but I feel like with, with just having one person you can have that connection with, yeah, it's great. But friendships are lacking overall. Like just trust is lacking and being able to feel like someone will just embrace you or love you for who you are, I feel like has been so rendered and damaged in, in today's age, just when we're so, so accustomed to seeing everything being perfected in one way or another. And if it's not, then we just numb ourselves by distractions and notifications and TV and whatever it might be, food. Yep. Um, exercise was one of mine. And um, um, now having that community, uh, that has led me to know that, and even stepping away, I'm not part of the community anymore, knowing that there are some freaking incredible people out there. Some very, very kind, loving, connected people who are genuinely looking to make a change and not looking to make a quick buck out of it or just... Um, use it for their own profit or own good, but actually genuinely you want to help people and doing it in a way that they know is not prescribed in a book uh, or that they've been taught to do. But so many of us, all of us can just listen to what is our truth inside. Like what is our intuition? Like just getting in silence or getting to do something that you love to do. Then you're connecting with that higher, whatever it is, energy, muse, God, power. And when you start doing that, magic starts flowing like you you can literally just get into flow state and it start affecting so many different people and then it's been now we're just talking about it before jumping on this podcast is being inside for several weeks here with with being in san jose and having all this smoke and fire around uh, getting outside and getting to where so we live in san jose we went to oakland um to uh to my wife's brother one of her brothers lives there and being outside and it's just such a different culture. And that's the beautiful thing about the Bay Area. It's so diverse and being at the lake. And uh, one of the things that I love to do, I used to play football is we were just throwing a pigskin around and getting back to just the receiving, just being able to catch the ball and, and, and feel my feet on the grass and being out in the sunshine and just connecting to earth and being able to breathe fresh air and then play. Yep play, get in a moment. Like I'd, I'd had these, these thoughts and just cause I'm launching this business and, 
and having, oh, it's not good enough. I need to do more. Constantly, never enough, right? I mean, yeah, there's goodness about it too. But when you're constantly on edge and constantly stressed, the play and just getting outside and getting that rest was just, it was, it was so significant. Like today I feel better than I felt in weeks. And it was just one afternoon of play and, and getting outside. Um, so, and being able to own that and being able to enjoy life more and uh, the more just distance and separation and, and just playfulness that you incorporate. And as one of the main things too, from Aubrey, it's just the more you start incorporate that, the more beauty you can create instead of having that mindset of that we are all a machines, the harder we push the machine, the more we'll accomplish. And yeah, it's, it's pure statistics. It's all measurable. Like, oh yeah, if you make a hundred, for example, like all salespeople know, if you make a hundred dollars every single day, like, yeah, you're measured for success. Well, I've averages. Yeah. yeah, right. And I, I agree, but it's just to me that it just, it deadened my soul. And, and what you're saying, like right before starting this podcast, yeah, I'm all about structure, but when it comes to these podcasts, like, yeah, I want it to be free flowing too. Like, do you get what I'm saying? It doesn't make logical sense, but yeah. yeah, you need to have structure, but you need to have flow. You need to have play in your life too. I love that. Yeah. For me, play has been, I'm a big kid and I've always been a big kid. And I think part of it is natural, but also part of it was growing up. I was always the youngest. So I was always the youngest uh, student in my class, always the youngest athlete on a sports team, just because I started like a year ahead of in school, I could have waited a year and been in the same like age group, but I was always the youngest. And so I think just having that younger mentality always kept me pretty young and maybe being the baby in the, in the family too. I'm sure that probably has something to do with it, but you know, playing is huge and it, it's, it, it's something that'll actually help you live longer and live. You know, I have this buddy of mine, his name's Dr. Joe Esposito. He's a chiropractor here locally and he's big in obviously health and wellness, but he's really big into it. Not just the chiropractic side, but so many different ways from nutrition to supplements to, uh, you know, biohacking type protocols. And he calls it, um, living like a candle burning brightly from start to finish. Like a candle is the same intensity in terms of the light that it emits when you first light it all the way until when it dies out. And he's talking about your life in correspondence with that. Like you want to burn like a candle, you want to burn bright the whole time. And so just kind of segueing with playing, it's super important. And so there is, I don't know if you've heard of these, but there's these blue zones around the world and blue zones. One of them, for instance, is Okinawa. And what a blue zone is, is it's a, it's a geographical location where for some reason, most of the residents, if not all of them have like a, a per capita age of like 90 or above. And, and they all exceed that age. Some of them are over a hundred years old. And they're all living and they're thriving, even at those, you know, ages where most people don't get to see. And they were trying to figure out what it was in these blue zones that it was helping them live so bright, so vibrantly for so long. And so we go back to the data, like you talk about, we go back to, you know, genetics, we go back to nutrition, we go back to all this stuff. But what they really started to find out on the studies that they were doing across the world, different blue zones was diets were different, lifestyles were different. But some of the common things they had together were things like play, like they would still play together. They were still in community together. They would still sing together. They would dance together. They would have fun together. And it's really interesting because in a world where we're based on performance and that matters, play matters just as much, if not more, if you want to A, enjoy your life and B, live a long life. So I think it's really interesting that you bring that up. And for people that, you know, aren't playing, it could be an ego thing. It could be maybe just not like a not knowing thing but get out there and do whatever makes you happy and, and start getting back to your roots as a kid, because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. And would you rather die satisfied, literally playing, throwing the football, or would you rather be miserable, you know, and, and not enjoying your life? So I think you're, it's, it's a great point. Yeah. And you really reinforced that last week. And I think you're such a bright example of, of how you integrate both. And you just, I mean, you've been on your path yourself. You try to just mustering through and, and to the bitter end, regardless of the circumstances. And, and there's a reason where you're at and what you're doing, what you're doing today, like how, how you're able to just take the pivoting of changes that come left and right and how you're still able to find a flow through it and how you enjoy it and still I mean, the, the, the story stuck with me when you, um, when you were hiking out with your children and how you were teaching them these, these beautiful things about how, how to just express gratitude and connect with God and, and be just in that moment um, and encouraging them through that and, and spending that time with them. Um, it can be simple things like that, but when you truly enjoy it, when you're saying when you were working from home, 
and how you're going to miss it now that, that your son, when your sons go back to school, that just being able to have that time with them and just standing there, like probably where you're standing right now and him, him being close to you. And, <laughs> exactly and right here. In the office, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and then having that, having that, um, yeah, it's uncomfortable and we're all in it. Like we, we were having to make do with what the uncomfortable situation is. And we're forced into dealing with not being as productive as we usually are. But the beauty of that, and I'm grateful I got a head start, was how, how do you make, how, how do you forgive yourself for not performing? And, and how do you love yourself for not performing? And how do you just be in a moment and enjoy it? regardless of what comes out of it, how do you just come back to just, how do you have fun with the people around you? And it's, it's, it's listening to what used to inspire you or still might, you know, there's for, for me personally, it was singing uh, for a long time and I was afraid of my own voice and I was afraid of what other people would think of my own voice. Like, like, like just embarrassed to put, cause when you, when you sing in front of someone else, it takes a little bit of bravery. It takes a little bit of confidence and, and honestly, maybe just not giving a fuck what other people think, you know? And so for years I would sing. And then as as soon as someone else was around, I would like sing to myself or just be quiet. Like I was just Mm -hmm. kind of embarrassed to share my voice. And through the years I've learned how to do that. And actually during COVID, which was a beautiful uh, learning was I saw this post somebody put up and it said, if you don't learn anything and I'll I'll elaborate in a second, but basically it said, if you don't learn anything during COVID, you've wasted your time. Like if you don't find something to do that you haven't already done, like now that you have more time Mm -hmm. essentially, because you're working from home or maybe people have been furloughed or just different things, you know, all those things that you've been putting off because of the excuse of work or career. If you don't come away with a new skill or something, a new hobby, you've wasted time. And I could see both sides of that. I could think, you know, that's kind of harsh and bullshit. And then I can also see, well, yeah, that makes sense. So I did pick up something that I wanted to do for years, which was singing. And last, <laughs> last mm-hmm. night I actually went out with a friend and we were doing karaoke and it was awesome. It was like nice. <laughs> sharing, <laughs> sharing my voice. It was just the two of us in this weird little room. Like it was cause it, you know, it was late and we, we were out having fun and we were just singing and I was just loving it. And I was really like putting my effort into it and like having a good time. And, you know, just, I think living your truth as much as that's become cliche as well, but whatever makes you happy going back to playing, whatever makes you inspired, whatever you can have fun with. You can just have fun, like throwing the football and getting outside and being in the sunshine and which has so there's so many benefits to that from the grounding to the vitamin D to the, you know, you know, you re- reduce inflammation and stress. Like there's actual health benefits, right. but then there's the happy that comes along with it too. So I, I love that you're working on that. And speaking of, of happy, I want to go back to uh, just one experience I had from fit for service real quick. And then I want to, I want to touch on your business and what you're building. But, um, one of my favorite experiences in uh, Malibu, and there was a lot of them, but one of them was uh, the bread machine. Do you remember this? Mm, so after, I think it was after, or maybe just before Aubrey and Whitney came out and did the sharing circle with everybody, with everybody from that fit for service, which was probably close to hundred people that year in 2019 was circled around them as they were talking. And either just before or just after, I don't remember when it happened, but it was around that time you got put into groups of like six or seven people. And like Mm. one person would stand in the very middle of that group of six or seven people that were surrounding them. And the people that were surrounding them would go like clockwise around them. And they would start like massaging their like neck and their shoulders Mm -hmm. and their arms and their legs, like nothing sexual at all, but just like very, and like, I had this super intense release of just joy and elation. I was crying. I was Mm. crying in front of people. And one of the ladies, Teresa, she was like, like that's, that's just a beautiful thing for you to do. Like you're, you're like, just, she just was like really taken aback by like my being in the moment. I don't know if you, you experienced the bread machine, but it was, I was like, I want to do the bread machine all the time. <laughs> I want to get like seven or eight people just to hang out. We'll just do like this circular, like massage, like ceremony. <laughs> did you, did you try that? Were you involved in that? Yeah. 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 That, that was, um, and I found that, okay, how do I receive? Cause, yeah. and, and that's, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely like a help. Yeah. And I think just how do I, how do I take off my, or just let the armor fall off at times? Exactly. Not always be, no, I don't need anything. Yep. I can give, but I'm not going to, yeah, I don't Receive. need anything. Or, exactly. It yeah. takes power. And, and, and for me, I'm the same way. I'm always the pleaser. Like even, you know, if, if we want to get into detail, like even like a romantic situation, like I really want to bring pleasure to people and it makes right. me happy right. yeah. to make people happy. And so when I'm giving the massage and like, you know, helping people and like, they're feeling good, I'm happy, but it takes a little vulnerability to share your emotion in that moment with perfect strangers. 
with sure. people, but it was the most loving, unbelievable. It was one of the most profound moments of my life. I'm not going to lie, which is so simple. And so that goes back to playing in a way. It goes back to trusting in your community and it goes back into letting people into your world and loving people and knowing like what you've said the whole time, part of your narrative with fit for services, there are people out there in the world that love you. And there are people out there in the world that like are your people and your tribe, even if you haven't met them or if they live somewhere across the world and you only see them once every couple of years. So yeah. I love that. And that was one of the things that I've come to terms with in a different way that I've ever expected it to is loneliness. Um, oh, yeah. I've, I've had, I mean, there's the saying of you're the average of the five closest people to you. And yep. there are times because I grew up and I just felt like I was very different all the time. I wanted not to live in a status quo. And Sweden is very much about status quo and not standing out too much. And I feel like you I, all look alike too. <laughs> <laughs> They're all like Greek gods and goddesses, or uh, uh, Norse gods and goddesses. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, thank you. And yeah. uh, um, the next, so what uh, I started connecting with was was uh, music uh, yep. very deeply, and hip hop and rap especially. And there was the artistic expression, and it was a whole basketball culture and that's eventually what led me here to the United States but how you could be so incredibly confident and just be out there and not care like just be wilding and and, and like just and it was profanity and all that stuff that was like not not a positive thing but it was just it it, it allowed me that expression to just fully immerse myself into something where where rules were not there like yep. you just you express yourself to uh, everything from artistry to profanity like it was it was it was so different and through that i found some of the deepest connections because there's some profound rappers out there and the lyrics they spit so i what do you like uh well uh, so most deaf talib Kali are two okay. that come to mind from the Hell east yeah. coast um from i mean the south atlanta has probably some of my favorite rappers like bob not some of the newer things that he's done but some of the older things. Yep. Um, you have, uh, I mean, even uh, today, it's Macklemore is one of them. You have Ace Hood is from Florida. I've gotten into it now. It's a whole lot more refined. Like it's more, now it's beats and melody, melody yep. from a, from a, uh, well, both rap, but also uh, EDM. Um, so when I listen to any type of, of music, and that's why I connect to podcasting too, is, <clears throat> is the truth that you spit or that you talk in the lyrics or how you convey that message. Yep. So conscious rap, you can say, or even some of it is like, and, and that is what, what is so incredible about the United States is the community around religion, um, Christianity. I mean, the, and, and they're all spectrums of anything they go to. There's so many different spectrums, but that is what I found the greatest community in. Um, Cause Sweden is very much, you are taken care of regardless of who you are because of the state and the government and the high taxes and so forth and, and free uh, universal health care, college, um, school lunches, the list goes on. It's, it's comfortable. But coming here and, and feeling I had this moment uh, where I really wanted to make it on my own um, and I was in University of Central Oklahoma. I was playing football and um, – I open up my fridge and I was so hungry and B.O.B. has this line uh, where he says, when you start opening up your fridge over and over again, um, something to this line, that's foolishness. What are you doing? Like something, it, it, it goes back to when you're at that state and I don't know if you've ever been in that state and that's when I realized that line, I mean, you don't have enough. Oh, but yeah, you wanted I grew up so, that way. <laughs> okay. When you want yeah. it so badly and you checked your fridge freaking 10 times, but still you go back number 11 because you just wish you can find something else, but you oh, know yeah. you don't have enough to get something else. Um, and that, that hit me hard. And that is, that is something now really truly wanting to give back, but, but being in that moment and having one of the experiences I have in Oklahoma, even though, yeah, there might be, have a very narrow mind of what the world might be or that a lot of that, that it, the United States is the land of the free and that everyone wants to be like the United States, which is not the case for the rest of the world. Right. Um, 
is that there are some incredibly loving, friendly, um, generous people who want to take care of you. Uh, and yeah, given it also comes down to, yeah, I look like I'm, I'm your regular, uh, white guy too. And that's a whole nother conversation that we don't need to go into. But, um, so one, I had a motorcycle that broke down right after I got it. Uh, <laughs> this is an interesting story, but about what kind of bike was it a crotch rocket or like a steel horse? It was a, what I turn into, it was a Suzuki SV650. Um, so it was a, a naked bike. Okay. Uh, so something in between. And uh, I wanted to turn into cafe, a cafe racer. But what had happened is, uh, and this is uh, an interesting story that would lead up to. So I went down, I was on this low, low budget. Uh, but I finally, I'd got money from, uh, from the tax return and I, I needed to get around. And so I, was, I found this very cheap bike, like, okay, I'm going to go down to Texas, Dallas, Texas from Oklahoma. And uh, so I did, jumped in the car with a Norwegian friend and we drove down. It was this iffy, uh, okay neighborhood, but it was, we, we got back there and it was just a, um, a mess in the back. And there was this motorcycle. I'm like, okay, it looks a little iffy, but he just painted um the entire tank and it it, it looked kind of nice and then i started i've never been on a motorcycle before <laughs> start wow riding it. first time with and this I, and I start, bike yeah and i start riding it right so uh you're living like, dangerous oh, there brother could i be doing this the owner and he was like eventually uh he's like okay like and and he um so he we come to to an agreement and he's like, oh, do you, do, you, do you guys want some whiskey before you leave? I'm like, no, what are you talking about? Are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> Trying to break bread with you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, as, um, yeah, having whiskey before jumping on a four-hour ride before never having ridden a motorcycle probably wouldn't have been the best that idea. That takes so. fucking balls, man. Good for you. <laughs> That's scary as shit. Like, like yeah. you, did you have full confidence in yourself? Like, no big deal. I was going to ride. Have you ridden a motorcycle before that? I've ridden mopeds. Okay. Uh, so that's a thing in, in Europe, right? Or, or yeah. So in yeah, Sweden, for sure. Yeah. It's so a thing I, here too. It's called when you get a DUI, <laughs> <laughs> especially in Georgia, they'll take your license away, but you can still drive a moped that goes like 40 miles an hour. It's interesting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Um, so I, um, yeah, I jumped I, and, and that's part of the, a, a positive relationship I have with fear. Uh, you can call it stupidity too. When I'm realizing, okay, I can completely F myself up, but then there's the pride of like, well, I'm not going to ask for help. Oh, and yeah. what is, what is this going to cost? Like, what, what can I, like, who, who do I need to pay in order to get this? No, I'm just going to figure it out myself. So all that, what could, should, or might happen just goes out. And that is, that is something that I've had since an early age is being able to be present in a moment, regardless of what might happen. Yep. I'm just doing it. And like five minutes in, I almost have a car swerve right into me. <laughs> but <laughs> four hours later, I'm exhausted. I get there. And the day after, uh, the, the motorcycle won't start. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that was what, what, what turns out. I don't know how to get it anywhere. I was, I was broke at that point. I didn't have any money left. I spent it all on a motorcycle. And I didn't know how to get it to the repair shop. And there was this uh, gentleman, just a random neighbor, who was like, hey, like, how, how, uh, do you need help with that? Like not, well, we just started talking and he was like, Oh, well, how are things going with your bike? And then I told him the story. He was like, Hey, let me take it over to a repair shop. And it was like 20 minutes away. I have, I have this, um, what do you call it? Um, trailer that I can put it on. I'm like, are you sure? Like, we don't even know each other. I didn't tell him that, but he was like, yeah, he says, let me go ahead and do it. And I'm like, Oh, can I trust this guy? And and yeah. I told him like, Hey, like, I don't know you. I don't know if you're just going to ride away with my motorcycle and I never see you again. Right. And he was like, Oh, that's a fair point. It's up to you. I'm offering up to you. I'm like, all right, let me just surrender to this moment and, nice. and let go. And so he, yeah, he, he uh, picked it up and, and took it in and, um, never, I met him probably one time after that. Um, but just that generosity and that kindness of someone you never knew or know just taking time out of their day to do something that's rather significant to to do for a stranger for sure and um um 
what ended up happening too with the motorcycle, and I'm just thankful that that everything went okay, is that the mechanics, like I've never seen anything like this. Like there are random bolts, nuts, and screws <laughs> that this been put together with. Frankenstein and, together. <laughs> yeah, and so much is missing. I can't believe this bike is holding up. You made it, I'm, yeah, the grace of God or whatever, the fates. I mean, got yeah. Home. yeah. Um, so he's like, yeah, I, I, I put, and I got all the screws and nuts and bolts I have spares of and just put it on where there were missing parts, but there's still some missing, but you should be good to be, be riding this. And, um, wow. Yeah. I mean, there, there's some of these stuff and there was another one, um, where, where I was riding so, so much, um, that you could start to see the threading on the back wheel. And yeah. I didn't know that was a bad thing. I'm like, oh, I'm going to ride. And like, I didn't know, like no one told the me. Wheels this fall off. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Literally. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, um, eventually there was a guy and, and I had low funds. He was like, okay, well, just buy the tire and I'll help you out. And there's another time where he just, the labor itself would have been an extra 150, but I was, I was broke at that point where I wouldn't yep. ask my parents for more money because I didn't want to just, yeah, when I make it might it as well own. been ten thousand bucks. Like it didn't matter. Right, it just, yeah. exactly. At that point, yeah, that's what it felt like. And he he took extra time out of his day. He stayed until after the the shop was closed, and he did it by himself. He switched a tire for me, and, and and there's so many more of these stories where that that I came across people like this in Oklahoma, where the main theme was they are all were part of the Christian community. And they all did this just because that is what they've been taught to do was the right thing. Yep. And, and just be like, love, like treat your neighbor. Like you would, I mean, yeah, it's, it's that saying like it, how you want to be treated, treat others, how you want to be treated the or actually, rule. yeah. Yeah. Or, or the Tim Ferriss way. It's like, um, what was it? I heard just the other day. I can't remember how it goes, but it was, it was different. It was how, because it was it was implying that you don't have much self love, so treat treat others. Yeah. Anyway, I, I need to skip that point. But why I'm bringing this 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 point up is when you live by principles, when you live by a set of of ethos or yep. rules or standards, when you have that in your life and you start looking outside of yourself. I think that's phenomenal. Like take what you want out of religion. And there's so many different ones that are out there and they're all have pros and cons to them. And I grew up in, in Sweden is one of the least religious countries or the least religious country in the world. A lot of the view is like, no, like who, who believes in God? Like that, then it, then it's looked down upon like you, all that you need is science. All we can all figure it out with just analysis, mind and rationale and kindness and thoughtfulness and, and empathy but, but that higher sense of there's something else, it wasn't there. Um, so, so bringing that up and now making a very long story out of this because it's very important with community is when you start connecting to people, um, and that is why I'm compelled to do it, even though I'm not religious, I'm, I'm spiritual, and I'm, I'm, I, I believe there's so many different ways we can connect. Um, I, I feel strongly called to connecting to people in different, just in churches because of the generosity, because of the, the genuine thoughtfulness and, and just what people can do. And that's what you see. I mean, I think more and more so just, it doesn't matter what you believe in. It doesn't matter what, what, what politics you believe in or what you think is wrong or right. Like kindness is really what matters. I agree. And people that use those things as divisive tools, um, they have many reasons for doing that, but they don't have to be divisive tools. Like I can get along with someone who's of any mindset, any, any thought process, as long as they're good human beings, you know what I mean? If they're not doing creepy shit to kids or hurting other people or like, like, is you're, if you're a good human being, I don't give a shit what you're into. Don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt other people. I don't, I don't care. And so I think most people lean too much on their fundamental beliefs that they were raised with. Like most people that believe a certain religion it's because three out of four of those people inherited it from their parents. And so if I grew up Catholic and three of my other friends grew up Catholic, it's safe to say that out of the four of us, three of us are going to still be Catholic to this day. And it's because that's what we know. And that's what we've seen, but that's not, it's not indicative of people that can get along and thrive together. And what you believe is important to you and it's right for you. And what I believe is important to me is right for me. And it's, you know, all those things, but you know, 
the, the world and the why behind the world, it really just comes down to humankind and human kindness and like helping each other. And so those people that helped you with your motorcycle and went above and beyond and, and because it was their Christian belief, you could be, you know, agnostic or atheist and not believe in anything. And you could do the same exact things. And so my point is just saying that I think that people need to stop using these belief structures and tools uh, as, as divisive and, and just being inclusive of each other. You know what I mean? And so, you know, I think, I think groups like fit for service do that. I think that people from all across the world, there's people literally from across the world that are in that group with mm-hmm. tons of different beliefs and they're all drawn together by the, the term fit for service. Like what that means to them showing up better in the world for themselves, for their businesses, for their relationships, for their spirituality, maybe all the above. And so there, there, there is common tissue. And I think that I'd like to see it in our life where we reach like unity consciousness and we're all one people and we all kind of work together towards something. And that might just be kind of like, you know, bullshit may never happen, but it doesn't mean we can't work towards it. it doesn't mean that we can't operate in that world. And even if it's just in our micro worlds, if it's my friendships, if it's my business clients, if it's, you know, day to day, how I operate in the world, like you choose how you show up. So I I love that uh, you have that experience too. And it, it, to me, it sounds like it doesn't matter to you what other people's belief structures is unless they're just, you know, good people. Right. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. So talk about a little bit about you diving into uh, this new business, the podcast, talk a little bit about like these new ventures you have going on because they're super exciting and, and I'm excited to, to hear more about them. So, yeah. So there's been a, ever since I was young, I wanted to, when I connected to something with my heart, what I truly enjoyed or where I lost track of time. And there've been quite a few ways that I've done this, but I realized that I was living in a lie where I was making a lot of money, but I was not happy. And I was living a story that was my father's story and my and and that's what i thought i needed to do to make him proud because his love is what i always craved and even having that awareness it's still so deeply ingrained that hey i need to do something to be deserving and feel happy and feel love i need to do these things in order to make my father proud and 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 just letting go of that story um and being brave to just find what it is it that I lose track of time and also listening to what is something when I speak to it that people start reacting like, wow, thank you for sharing that. And that is around performance. Um, and some of the things that you've heard me talk about is, is the ferocious drive to keep on (laughs) pushing through and has served me so much, but has been to my detriment at times too. And it's a glorified area, especially in the Western world, that performance and winning and being number one by any means necessary, having the incredible luxury mansion, the whatever, BMW, the, the Mercedes, the Tesla nowadays, and just being on top of your game on all types of levels, and then more and more and more and more. There's this statistic, I think, I don't know, before 19, 20 something, there was no, there are no storage units. And then um, it was like, I can't remember the date, uh, the exact year, but then there was a significant event that happened in history. And now we have more storage units than whatever their McDonald's is, whatever. There was some like ridiculous number. And, And what that means is that we have so much in excess we have so much in excess, so many things. And the more things we have, the more attention we need to pay to them. And eventually our things end up owning us and we don't own our things. 100%. So I find, I found myself being so consumed by my numbing mechanisms whenever I would get uncomfortable was to shop or buy things uh, or it would be... That's because- normal, by the way, not to cut you <laughs> off. But um, I got a book that I'm writing. It's called Happy Wealth and it's 10 Steps to Becoming Wealthy Happily. And a big part of the beginning is mindset and emotional behaviors and behavioral finance. And it's where people want to buy things to make themselves feel better. Mm -hmm. 
And it's, 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 a, it's retail therapy. It's going out and buying that new thing that you want because it's going to give you happiness. But then you realize a lot of times it doesn't bring you happiness. So you, drive, you buy the next thing and the next thing. And that, like a lot of people get into that hamster wheel mm. of performance and or rewarding themselves, but it's really internally where they have to fix first so that those things do bring them happiness. If yeah. that makes some sense. Yeah. Retail therapy. <laughs> I'm going to remember. That's a good, that's a good word. Retail therapy. And you know, what's yeah. been fucked up is a lot of people during COVID have the friggin' Amazon prime and shit just shows up in a day or two. And it's like instant gratification. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I found myself every time that would happen. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, it's, 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 um, and it was just, I would accumulate more and more and more. And then I needed to make more and more and more. Uh, and then her have, and it hit me and, and Aubrey said this too, Aubrey Marcus is like, it, sometimes you might just need to experience it yourself to really get it. It doesn't matter how many times somebody else tells you, you need to experience it yourself to really understand like, Hey, this is not what I want, or this is not going to bring me happiness. And that's what I realized is, is when I started like making more money and, and buying all the things that I wanted, I'm like, I still, still the same, still don't feel any different. And I have all these things and it became more now I need to take care of them. Now it's, I need to insure these things. And it's just like, I'm paying for all these things and everyone using them. And, and it, it, one of the most devastating, or, so it was back to motorcycles. Again, I had a Ducati, um, what was it? 1100 Evo. And it was a, I made it part of who I was, uh, yep. And my identity, and, and I was working for a Silicon Valley startup, and it was this no-name startup when I started with, with the company, and then it became this monster rocket ship, and it was recognition from, from every week to almost every single day. Wow. And, 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 and it, it um, had the highest IPO in, in security, cybersecurity history. So with that, so many people joined just out of the pure essence of ego, and mm-hmm. I was so much part of that ego ride. And, and eventually that's what led to um, me associating my identity and my worth and everything I was with that. And, and I made this Ducati, the color of the company was, so it was red, it was a red Ducati. And I called it Falcati because it was a Falcon as a logo. Like it really, like I went all in, right? So, <laughs> and, uh, but what, what, ended what did up that ha- cost you? If you don't mind sharing 30 grand, 20 grand. Oh no! Like I'm, I'm always smart, but I'm always making sure to have to have to have a good uh, investment Wise strategy. Like, yeah, it's like always got to be like a year, like two, three years old. So yeah, like yeah, it would have been expensive, but it was a was it like an eight eight grand bike? But the amount of customization, like the guy had put in, was um, probably another seven eight grand too. And usually, you know, like if you buy, if you're a fan of motorcycles. Um, a lot of people who are like to customize it. And if you customize it, you will never, ever get your money back. Ever. And I learned, I learned that the hard way and I've customized so much and I've spent so much money on that. <laughs> so I realized I found this guy who had done everything uh, possible to this bike. I'm like, this is a, this is a glorious bike. And, and his, his story, he couldn't ride it anymore. His, his friend was hit and killed right behind him while riding on a motorcycle. I'm like, wow probably should not pick up this bike because it feels like it has just this negative, I don't know, energy to it. And I should have, I should have listened to it. Um, I didn't. And, um, um, eventually I, I found myself so stuck in this company and just fighting tooth and nails over titles, over all kinds of things. And it was just consuming me. Um, and one day, and, 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 and at that point I was starting to lose focus on my family uh, and just, I, I, I was starting, it was such a rough patch that I was, I was like, okay, it's okay. If it doesn't work out between my wife and I, I'm okay. I still have my job. Like that's what matters. Wow. Yeah. And my, and I was on this motorcycle and, and my wife calls me and it's like, yeah, Sage has been hit and killed. So Sage was our cat. And, 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 and at that moment I just, I was, I dropped to my knees. Like when I kind of came home and it was such a, it was such a loss, like I lost a son um, but it made me realize in that grief is that life is something that can't be taken for granted to this company and to any company. You're just a number at the end of the day, unless you're a very tight knit family. And Unfortunately, no one, yeah. yeah, no one would ever care and no one ever, uh, no one. And I realized that I am not taking care of myself or anyone else around me. All I'm living for is this company. 
and it's never going to have like at the end of the day, when I'm looking back, am I going to be so happy that I rose to ranks and made so much money, but I ruined all my relationships and, and, and to top it all. And I realized I need to change. Like I need to change my life. And, um, shortly later on, like a few months later, and there was a guy who I was so intrigued. He was my, my first manager there. And he was all about meditation and biohacking and, and, and integrating that. And he saw when I saw no path, he was like, this is how you got to do it. Like, this is the path forward. I'm like, you're freaking incredible. I don't know how you get it. The like, obstacle how, how you, is the way. Yeah, exactly. The <laughs> obstacle is the way he was literally like he, he was that. And, and I was, um, and he rose the ranks and he opened up an office in Austin and, um, uh, things didn't go as expected. Um, and, and after a year, when I went and visited, you know, I was on a different work trip. We worked for the same company still in Austin. I, I talked to him and he, he took, it was like, he took, he took the punch and he was still this positive and I'm going to look through everything that has ever happened and I'm going to charge forward. Like, Hey, and they had these, all these motivational quotes left and right. And, and I thanked them, um, a few months later when I left the company, cause I realized I couldn't keep doing this. And he, he, I realized I heard that he was going to go on a sabbatical and he was having some struggles mentally. And, um, I just thanked him. And, and later, just shortly after I found out he committed suicide. Oh my goodness. And sorry to hear that brother. Yeah. And it was at that point I realized, and that's what Macklin Moore, if you really, if you're in this place right now, Macklin Moore, uh, the heist, the album, the heist, um, wings is one song, um, 10,000 hours. There's so many songs in that album that really goes into, um, he, he has one line where he says, if I would have done it for the money, I would have been a fucking lawyer. And I realized that's me. Um, and he has another song called Neon Cathedral. And, and it made me realize that I'd become a workaholic. He, he speaks about his addiction to alcohol and drugs. And there's so many different ways that addiction can show itself. Yep. And for me, it was work. Um, and it almost crumbled my life in so many different ways. And when you attach your identity to something, anything like that, and like you can ruin your life. And that's what happened. And like, I don't know what would have happened if I wouldn't have had my family, when I had my wife close to me. And this, this guy, he didn't, he didn't have anyone around him when everything came crashing. He was the same, like high charging, incredibly brilliant guy riding his triumph motorcycle, like just good looking guy, 31 years old, his career falls apart. And he's been this incredibly high achiever performer. And what's, why should I live anymore? And, and unfortunately, and I think that's coming up now at COVID during COVID more so than ever, when so much is taken away from so many people, where their identity is really being challenged. <coughs> Excuse me. And, that is what Safina is. And that is the company that I'm launching. Uh, and that is Sophia is my wife. Athena is my daughter combined. It's Safina. It also means in Swahili, Noah's Ark. So it's really getting on that before the tides and all the water starts rising. Are you going to get on that boat and really start realizing before you sink? Are you, are you, are you going to take a path where you're going to survive? Are you going to, are you going to drown? That's beautiful. <clears throat> So that's what a podcast is about is exploring the highs and the lows and the stories you were never told around elite performance. And a company is going to be in that vein uh, as well. It's going to be surrounding elite performance and might dive into, uh, it's going to have probably a work in and workout aspect It's going to have a community feel to it as well, where you can, um, yeah, like a subscription model where you can, you can have, a theme, even, even like fit for service, like a mastermind feel like you're going to have a community of elite performance because it takes, it takes one to know one. Like it, it can't just be any type of people who, who are going to be a part of a community. Cause if you're a high charger, if, if you're someone who won't take no for an answer, like there's a certain caliber of kind of a <laughs> pride or even like what you even, who you would associate with for sure. uh, and let in and, and, and for so many people who are elite performers, letting people in and being vulnerable and sharing is one of the most difficult things. So creating a community where there are going to be a theme on a quarterly, monthly basis, a, a monthly book 
Um, and they're going to be like a weekly challenge. For example, we're going to journal where you're going to have, what is, for example, what is, what is the, what is the conversation that you've been putting off with someone? That is the conversation you're going to have this week. And then you're going to be, have this community during the week check-in, you're going to share how that went. And Beautiful. having that accountability and having, for example, maybe the next week and then having that theme, maybe the next month is, is more into to facing your fears from a physical perspective. I'm going to take a cold shower every single day or I'm going to lay out without my shirt on in the grass and, <laughs> and, and, I'm going to be, and I'm going to be there and people are going to be able to stare at me regardless of what you look like. And um, maybe even in full business attire and, 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 and recognize how, what that feels like, or even, okay, to so this week, I'm going to ask someone for help and it needs to be significant and having things to work on from that and work in perspective. And then one of the big things that I've gone into is, is so many of elite performers get into just what you look like. And, and for mine, like I said before, shopping was one, but exercise is another, just the muscles, um, and uh i've i've toned it down i sold the majority of all my weights and now i do gymnastics calisthenics and kettlebell work only which is amazing yeah and i'm stretching and i feel better than i ever felt uh because i've haven't and that's one of the 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 um meathead uh kind of identity is like f stretching like who needs that bs oh my like, goodness yeah it's, it's such a um a non-evolved fitness mind it's, yeah. uh, it's exact. I mean, I was a meathead at one point in my life and it's very much power and strength and, um, you know, trying to look good, but like, it's, it's so fleeting and it's, you need the stretching, you need the yoga, you need the breath work, you need the, everything that goes with it, man. It's like, it's a, it's, it's so much, but really if you dial it in, it's, it's so comprehensive and you don't need all these implements, like you don't need a ton of equipment. You really could just use your body for the most part is what you're doing. And then you have some kettlebells and some stuff like I'm the same way. I've become very, uh, there's a book that I started getting into called essentialism. You touched on this point already with not having a ton of shit you don't need. And that includes workout gear, like a jump rope for me, my body, and like maybe a kettlebell. And I use the steel mace swinging around. Like that's pretty much all I use get out and run. I mean, you don't need, you don't really even need equipment. You can use just your body and be fit as a Greek God. No doubt. Yep. So that that's going to be the second part is having a program that you follow on a weekly basis. And either if you have no equipment, it will be body weight. If you do and use your kettlebell or have a pull up bar. So that, that is in the stretching part. That is, that is the second phase. And, and we touched upon right there as something I thought about from a lifestyle perspective echo minimalism is something i thought about and echo minimalism is a, say what you want about it i don't know what your 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 thoughts what thoughts come up when you when you hear it but it's it's similar like i when i when i have these realizations i've really dive in like it's like essentialism or minimalism i've i've started donating a bunch of stuff yep and um like what you said about you used to have was it eight 17 suits. It was a lot of suits. You had 15 of- suits, bow ties, cufflinks, pocket squares. I was a fucking clown. <laughs> <laughs> a good looking one. <laughs> I appreciate it. I mean, yeah, you know, it looked good, but it was, a, it was, it was, it was going back to what you were talking about hundred percent with that company that you were with in Silicon Valley of keeping up with really those, I don't want to say that didn't matter, but like impressing people or, or, or trying to look a certain way and, I wasn't living my truth. I was following the crowd because Mm -hmm. I I wanted to be the sharpest dressed person. I wanted to stand out. I wanted to have that, um, that gravitas, like, like, look at me, like I'm successful. I'm, I'm powerful. Like, and all that shit went out the window, dude. Like, this is how I rock now. T-shirt, shorts, jeans, whatever. Even, even in meet client meetings, I'm not much more dressed than this because, you know, it's not about what I look like. It's what I can do for you. So. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm completely with it. I, uh, well, you see, so this is, I have two blazers. I used to have more, but this white shirt, I wear the same white shirt every single day. Hell yeah. Uh, and I have a black, well, I'm not taking it to the full extreme, but I have like white. The Steve have Jobs. Black, <laughs> right. Black and, and white t-shirts. So I'm really, t- I'm really, 
Because that is one of the things is I was so consumed by what other po- people thought about me. Like my physical exterior was so much, I, that is how I got love or gratification. Ego. But, yeah, but then it didn't allow me to really show who I was uh, or allow other people in because I was so much thinking about what do they think or what should I think about myself? What do I look like? And the more I just, I, I'm going to wear all black. All right, that solves it. I don't need to make a decision. That's it. That's, that's it. <laughs> so... Um, yeah. And, and echo minimalism is the way that, yeah, if, if we're all were to do it, like talk about that, is that, is that your footprint in the world? And like, not, it sounds like it has something to do with the I coined it. I mean, I just came up with it. Right. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's being combining just how do you have an ecological or organic, uh, approach to your life, everything from what you wear to what you buy, uh, to like, yeah, it. everything, everything that you can buy, even though conscious like, living in a sense. Yeah. And then yeah. even to your food, like grass fed meat, like or, organic food. And then what you buy, be, be conscious of it. Be mindful of what you buy and buy only what you need and don't, yes. don't buy more and, and do, and there are plenty of things that there's enough. Like we, 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 we get so trapped in thinking that we need to have all these things to bring us happiness. Really it's just experiences and the people around us that will bring 100%. us that happiness. So if, if we just, if we have things that are high quality that will last us and that we love instead of like, Oh, well, I'm going to have 10 different types of varieties or 20 different shirts and all of them going to be different. Then a lot of your attention is going to be put on. Is it really that important what you look like and how you match your clothes every single day or, and then, and then you put in, let's say your, your coffee sweetener that is some whatever two, three different types of artificial sweeteners and, and then you're going to have your, your coffee that is low quality, but it was, it's what you always drank from, from Starbucks. They have good coffee too, but, but I'm just saying as, a, as an example, like when, when you start just making habitual things, and I've been there too, and I have so much to thank for for my wife, is when you start being gradual and like start, start understanding what it is, all these things start adding up. Yep. And the more you start just reducing things and really realizing what is it that I'm putting in my body, and what is it that I'm wearing? And, and then we probably wouldn't have, if, if everyone just makes small changes and it hasn't, it doesn't need to be, and now we're talking rather extreme, but if we're all making these changes, like, yeah, you would probably see less of these fires that we're having in California right now, less of these tornadoes that we're having, less of all this freaking, like it's, it's, I mean, my family, pollution. My, less pollution. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we could all feel it if you're in a city, how the temperature dropped during COVID. How I'm about sure. the, the skies clearing up in, in uh, LA? Like that was a huge thing. Like back before right. all the smog and, and fire and stuff, like for it, right when COVID hit, like right around like March, April and May, I remember Rogan talking about it a bunch of times. He's like, the skies are clear. And like, they, they haven't been that way because a lot of the cars were off the road, like the 401 yeah. or whatever it is out there. Um, it was really impressive that like, maybe it was mother, mother earth or Gaia, whatever you want to call it. Like her way of like getting us to like leave earth the fuck alone for a while. Stop destroying yeah. it, you know? Sure. Uh, and that's, and that's what, um, so my wife and her family were saying, like they, they've, they've lived here their entire life. They've never experienced fires unless the last few years until the last few years. And it's never been this extreme ever before. And, um, uh, one of the things that happened during COVID and I wrote a, a poem about it too, was when we went out to nature, everything started becoming so much more wild again because people started traveling less and animals started coming out. Yeah. And I, I remember a visceral moment <laughs> when it was this half, half neighborhood, half, na- half nature, but it's a nature path in this between two neighborhoods. And, um, uh, I was out with my daughter it was maybe eight o'clock, something right after eight in the morning. And it's usually at dawn when you, some of these more wilder creatures come out and, um, it's pretty cold or maybe in the forties. And, um, so my daughter is, is two and a half at that point. And we, we walk and, uh, all of a sudden I see, uh, Whoa, is that a dog? And, and, and I go close. No, that's not a dog. It's, it's, it's a coyote. Oh, wow. And, um, for anyone who knows, I thought I didn't know before, but coyotes don't really attack people and there are very rare cases and they eat usually very skittish of people unless they have rabies and there's something wrong with them yeah Mm -hmm. um but what happened in that time too is that there was a big eagle landing on top of a a uh, (laughs) big pine tree right next to it and 
if you really start paying attention, you can feel when just nature and there's wild and, and you, if you really been in the wild, you start realizing that you don't matter anymore. Like At it doesn't, all. your life does not matter. It's the great equalizer. Yeah. I mean, we're one with nature, but at the same time here today, gone tomorrow. It's incredible. And I think especially living in a city, you get so accustomed to like, oh, well, I have everything that I ever need. And we, we run this place. But then getting into nature and especially that day and my daughter ran ahead of me. I'm like, no, like and I ran after like we're going the other way, like we're getting out of here because <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, um, I realized and, and the, the poet is uh, poem is called um, I think Wild Divine and Death or something along those lines. But it was really it, one of the lines goes into welcome to the wild brother and, and it goes into here anything can happen and and no one will ever care because you're all part of this ecosystem you've just created an artificial reality to blind yourself to everything else that really is life and now that you tapped in and now that you're part of this reality or now you're part of the wild again feel what it feels smell what it smells understand that every moment is sacred and that you can't expect anything to happen because you need to be on your toes and you need to be very present. I might not be in danger, but my two and a half year dollar is. Very much. Yeah. Especially if something happened to you and she had to fend for herself and try to get out of there I, or get home. Like it, your life is very fragile. Yeah. And, and realizing that sense of connection is incredibly powerful. Like if we start listening to that, and that's when I start listening more to my intuition is there's so many messages that it can come through that is truth. And if we listen to them, we can work less. <laughs> oh, for I mean, sure. Yeah, and we, we can just start listening to what, what is really trying to come through because it's usually always in the best intention. And the more we stop tapping into that, and it goes back to the story, is starting to listen to that message more, starting to trusting that more. Because before I thought that was weakness, right? No. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just ego, man. And it's also, um, you know, it's, it's, it's beautiful the flip side to it is getting into nature. And this is something I've been doing over the last couple of years, maybe a little bit more really ever since I started running because I, I run trails and I try to get out into weird places and difficult places and um, challenge myself. That's the competition side, but it's also the nature side as well. The spirituality side, cause it's very meditative for me. It's very, mm -hmm. I can get into a flow state when I'm running pretty easy and I could either really drift off or I can dial in. And it's, it's, uh, nature is a really great way to do that. And, and what you were talking about earlier with, you know, hiking with my boys and it's just something very calming and soothing and almost, you know, we, we belong there, like getting back into nature. Like that's where we came from. We didn't have houses. We didn't have structure and cities when we first were, you know, created and transcended through the years from different types of, you know, cavemen and troglodytes and, you know, all these different forms of human beings, like to where we are now, we lived on the land and we were lived amongst creatures and the elements and it made for much different times and much different people, but that's in our DNA. Like that's, that's, we go back to the earth when we die. I mean, if mm. you think about it theoretically, like when, when you, when you get, or physically you, you get buried or cremated, you know, unless there's some other weird shit you could do. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I think there's a power there and for you to recognize that and to be impacted enough by it to look at life differently your perspective on your relationship with, you know, nature and your family and, and even going back and being amused to write poetry. Look how powerful that is. It's incredible. Yeah. It's just allowing yourself to allowing it to happen and surrendering to it for it to happen. Cause it brings so much. Um, and that is part of what I left corporate. I started realizing that I've lost my creative touch, my curiosity, Yep. I became a robot, a very unhappy one and very much on autopilot. And, um, uh, that won't last. Good things won't last and good things won't come to you if you're an autopilot. And, and I was very much, uh, I was woken up to that yesterday too. Um, is when you do things, the same thing in and out every single day, if you don't travel, if you don't put yourself just out there, and let go of, I need to get, do these things today unless these will be the consequences or because A, B, and C. And like we talked about meditation too, um, just quieting the mind and knowing there's 
like the world doesn't care if this gets done today or tomorrow. Yes, there is urgency. And yes, you should be like, there are things like as entrepreneurs and whoever you are, like, yeah, you should be accomplishing things. And that's gratifying, but also being able to tapping in and listening, taking breaks, because that is some, sometimes when the magic really will happen, when you will get the clearest answers. Yep. I agree. And that's, that's something I've been working on over the years is just that mental respite and that rest. And we talked about Paul check, I think on your show when I was on Mm -hmm. there, but uh, your podcast and Dr. Rest, Dr. Sleep is one of the most powerful doctors you'll ever need. And you won't need another doctor. There's the four doctors and one of them is Dr. Rest, Dr. Sleep. And if you, if you hold those four doctors, natural doctors, um, in accord and you hold them with respect, you'll never need other doctors because you can heal yourself and you can, you know, rest is so underrated. I mean, you can work out seven days a week, but if you get three or four hours sleep a night, you're going to kill yourself. You're going to cause mental disease. You're going to cause physical, you know, ailments. I mean, the body is so, it's, it's, it's so miraculous and it's, it, it does, it has everything you need, but you have to pay attention and you have to go in, like you said, introspection, discernment, and listen what comes up. And there are times where I know I need something and I'm just listening to my body and I just, I, I intuitively gravitate towards it. And so just having that kind of dialed inness to yourself can be a difference between a, a life well lived and a life full of, you know, disease or frustration or mental issues kind of thing. Mm. So I think it's, it's beautiful that you've the whole narrative of our conversation, you've mentioned surrender and, you know, going inward and, and, and paying attention to what comes up for you. I mean, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a special gift. And for you to dial in on that and hone in on that, I think is beautiful. So it's uh it's good to hear that other people are out there doing the same things. Likewise, brother. Yeah, man. So, so what's on the agenda for you for the rest of uh, 2020, just looking to get, get through with building, you know, Safina on the podcast side and, and the business side, like what, what, what are you looking forward to for the next few months? Yeah. Um, a move to Sweden is also a goal. Uh, okay. So immigration is just finishing becoming a citizen here and that, and that got postponed due to COVID, but, uh, Sophia, my wife being able to, 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 uh, be, and yeah, legally in Sweden too, for a long amount of time. So we're, so we're working on both of that, but that is, it is a primary thing and just uh, becoming more of a pon- conscious parent uh, is a is a goal of mine and researching how to play, like rediscovering that different types of games. Um, and one of the biggest things in this goes line as well, the more I push and the more I tell her what to do, 100%. usually the more she resists and the yes. less she does it and the more angry everyone else gets. <laughs> So I get, I get two quick, uh, things that have been super powerful for me. The first one is get on their level in terms of playing with your kids. And Mm -hmm. most kids are a lot shorter than us. And so you have to get down on the ground with them and like BI level with them. And that changes the whole dynamic for both of you. Mm -hmm. And then exactly what you just said is, 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 is another tool Mm -hmm. is, um, playing the game that they want to play and, Mm -hmm. and not, not changing it, just like doing what they want to do and letting them be kids. And that, that for me, like, um, a lot of times my kids want to like play tag or hide and go seek and like all these different things. And instead of like setting up rules or things that we think the way that it should be, like letting them be in their creative mind and creative spirit and letting them, kids are our best teachers. I heard this from Kyle Kingsbury somewhere along the line and it made so much sense to me was they teach us about patience and, and the lack of patience we have. They teach us about, um, you know, uh, not being assholes. Like if, if you yell or if you get mad at your kid, like it's, you know, it's really easy to hurt their feelings because they're just like raw energy, raw emotion. I've learned so much from my kids. I'm so thankful. They're my, they're my best teachers. And I think that if we can really just get in accord with them and not try to dictate, because we always try to dictate our world and our job and our fitness. Like if we could just let go and play, I mean, that's, and I still work with this. There's times where I'm not good at this and I fuck it up, but I am mindful of it. And I am like you working towards being more conscious around those things for sure. And, and I think that's a beautiful lesson and a gift for all of us as parents now during COVID. Right. <laughs> how, do you, how do you play and connect with your kids? Because they need it. We need it. I think we all. What's some just, of her favorite games? What does she like to play with you? Hmm. Or in general, what does, she like, what does she like to do? What is she into? Puppet shows. Puppet shows. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of puppet shows. Um, that's really funny. And, yeah, I mean, you have the tag, you have the hide and seek. We we started doing, and she likes this too, which is a great thing now that we can't get outside that often, is uh, ladder. Okay. Um, like ladder work, like you do as an athlete. 
Uh, oh, hell so, yeah. Yeah. She thinks that's super fun. Being able to, to, to sing and dance is, is amazing. Beautiful. Um, she got it from her mom, but now, yeah, just getting creative. Like my, so my wife's, uh, brother, his fiance played this game. Was it called green and red? When green you light, stop red and light go, kind of thing. Hey, green light. Exactly. That's what it is. Yes. Yeah. That's the name. But it made me realize, wow, like it's such a simple game but it brings variety and she loves it. Right. <laughs> and, 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 that, and that's, that's what I'm talking about. I want to learn more games like that, like things that I forgot that I used to do as a child. Right. So yep. being, being paying attention to, right. Bringing it back to, I'm going to schedule 15 minutes every day just to focus on what can I do for my wife and my daughter, Beautiful. regardless of what comes up and, and just be in that time and get creative. And I knew, I know that made such a big difference when I do it. And when I don't do it, yeah, it really just, it's more focused on myself and, and my business. And <laughs> it, it's not positive. It might to my mind, like, oh, I can get more done in 50. No, it, it's, it's gonna, it will bring back so much more. It was just dedicated towards, for me, it's my, my wife and my daughter. Oh, yeah, brother. You're a beautiful human being. And I'm, I'm so lucky uh, to call myself your friend and, and have you around in my life. And as we grow and connect and, and, and as our, our relationship takes form and shape, man, I'm excited to see what the future holds, but uh, you know, keep killing it. You're an amazing human being. You're loved and you're powerful. You're mighty. He's the badass, the amazing Sebastian Engstrom. I'm Jesse T. Be sure to catch us on next week's episode of the Jesse T show.